spotted this APC workshop power strip in the bargain bin at Micro Center. It's got eight power outlets, 800 joules of surge protection, and a 15-foot long power cord. Can hardly get any power strip for 10 bucks these days, so this was a steal. Is it too good to be true? Let's find out. Let's see what we're dealing with here. Product info, warranty registration, cord nicely wrapped up. This is 14 gauge, good to see, nice and solid. Switch feels good, pretty lightweight, doesn't feel too flimsy. All the creaking is from the rubber bumpers shifting, not the actual casing flex. 120 volts AC, 15 amps, 50 or 60 hertz, pretty standard there. Claims 400 volts line to neutral, 500 volts line to ground, and 400 volts neutral to ground. I'd hope such a problem would be caught in quality control, but first off, let's make sure this thing is electrically safe. I know the workbench outlets are properly wired. Plug in, power on, quite dim, but the protection light is illuminated. Plug in my circuit tester, got a green light, reading a correct. In addition to the protection indicator, this unit also has an overload warning indicator, which apparently will light up if more than 12 amps are pulled. Teardown time, because I want to see how those circuits are done and what else is going on inside here. Bumpers actually fit fairly snugly. Really got to turn it inside out to get this one off, or maybe it'll just be along for the ride. Other side. This one comes off easier because it doesn't have the hanger loop on it. All eight screws loose, or not. There we go. A little bit of a catch on this end. Got a little bit of blobtastic action going on on some of these larger solder joints, but not too bad. Don't see any whiskers bridging somewhere they shouldn't be. Got traces reinforced with extra solder for the high current path. And we have these cutouts for better isolation. Have some pretty solid looking connections on the solder side. This one on the ground wire is a little bit lean. Everything seems fairly well secure, so it could take a little bit of abuse and not risk things bending somewhere they shouldn't be. Going to see if I can work PCB out to get a better look without messing up anything else that I'd want to keep working. Okay. Did a little bit of PCB tracing and reverse engineering. Some stuff I like, some stuff I really don't like. Starting from the input side. Capacitor C1 is an X cap between line and neutral for a little bit of noise filtering. That's nice to see. From there, it goes through the main power switch and circuit breaker to fuse F1. This is a thermal fuse. Apparently it is a set safe RT99, the best I can read those teeny tiny little numbers that provides thermal protection for the surge protection stack. From there, it goes directly to MV1, which is between line and neutral. After that, a branch off to fuse F3. Both fuses F2 and F3 are UMI22ER thermal fuses. Fuse 3 feeds MV2 between line and ground, and fuse 2 is for MV3 between neutral and ground. We'll get into some of the ratings of the MOVs and how they relate to the device overall rating in a little bit. So far so good. I'm glad to see thermal fuses. MOVs can sometimes go into rather spicy failure modes when hit too hard. Diode D1 is a half-wave rectifier providing a DC supply to the indicator lights and the overload sensing circuit. This is where it gets strange. D4 here, the green LED, this is listed as the protection working indicator. But if you look here, there's not much happening. Just R1 and R2, identical 13 kilo ohm dropping resistors, and that's it. Two resistors, an LED, and back to neutral. So what's it even doing? The best I can tell, D4 will only turn out if the unit takes effectively catastrophic damage. Other than that, I'm not sure. The only other things that would extinguish it would be the thermal fuse F1 opening or the main circuit breaker opening. And if those happen because of a surge causes an overcurrent, you got problems. Referring to the user information, when the power switch is turned on, the green protection working indicator illuminates. If the indicator does not illuminate when the power switch is turned on, the unit has sustained damage and is no longer capable of protecting your equipment. There we go. D4, the protection indicator, will only turn off if the unit takes catastrophic damage. Related to that, this device features an internal protection which will disconnect the surge protection component at the end of its useful life. If this situation is undesirable for the application, follow the manufacturer's instructions for replacing the device. 
except it doesn't tell you that those devices have actually failed. That's not a great design. Definitely will trick a lot of people. Would have fooled me until I took this thing apart and analyzed it. Down here is where things get a little bit more fun. I am a fan of this circuit. Got another identical pair of 13K resistors, R6 and R5. These provide voltage and current limiting to diode D7. This is the red LED, the overload indicator. D7 is controlled by transistor Q1, NPN, KN2222A. 2222A. The overload sensing circuit consists of a current transformer, a couple diodes and capacitors, D2, D6, C2, and C3, which form a half-wave voltage doubler, resistor R3 and R4 set the point at which D7 will turn on. As current increases, the output of the current transformer will rise. This is rectified by the doubler, and the resulting DC is passed through R3 to the base of Q1, and then returns through R4. R3 and R4 have values chosen based on the performance of Q1, such that when excessive current is detected through the transformer, D7 will illuminate to warn the user the unit is overloaded. As far as I can tell, D2 looks to be a Zener diode, I cannot see its part number because of how it's mounted. Overall, a decent amount of stuff going on in here. Some stuff I really like to see, and other stuff like that protection working indicator I really don't like. Time to try to put the little heat shrink hats back on the MOV and thermal fuse packages. Aren't super tight, but tight enough to maybe contain some of the fireworks. Make sure there aren't any resistors or any other components that are touching something they shouldn't. Let's see if this thing can go back together the same way it came apart. If you're enjoying my antics, drop a like to help more people find this video, and consider subscribing if you haven't yet. More info, links to my socials, and ways to support the channel can be found in the description below. No user serviceable parts, not from the electric hazard, but from how much of a pain in the butt it is to put it back together. <laughs> Something over here isn't seating. A wire in the wrong spot. There, that feels a lot more solid. It's not feeling like I'm crushing something in the process. Question is, will this bumper go back? This one has it out for me. It's not going. All right, there we go. No screws left over. And another three, two, one, don't blow up. The green light's on, and the circuit tester still says it's correct. For the load test, I got my kilowatt plug-in meter on the laundry receptacle, using the laundry circuit because I know it's a home run right to the panel here. For the load test, I'm using a 1500 watt space heater with a small fan pointed at it so its internal thermostat does not cycle. It's plugged into the furthest outlet on the power strip just to give it the worst case scenario. Turn that on, got an indicator on the heater, thermostat to max so it can't turn off. Step one, 600 watts, 900 watts, 1500 watts, and the overload light has illuminated. Just slightly more than 12 amps being pulled at the outlet. Heater is definitely warming up. Fan is helping move that nice cool air over it. No sign of distress from the power strip, as expected. Unfortunately, a few minutes in, somewhere around here, I just heard the click of the thermal limit cycle inside the heater. And sure enough, it is now pulling 7.45 amps instead of 12. Even with the fan blasting cool air over it, apparently not quite fast enough. Yeah, that's already quite hot. Well, change of plans time. This thing refuses to go back into full power mode. It simply cannot dissipate enough heat. And we're going to plan B. Here's plan B. Little fan coil heater says it's 1500 watts. Have not tested this thing yet. Right, that's full throttle. Overload light is on. 11.4 amps. Certainly going. Gonna reset the stopwatch here now that that's stabilized. What happens if I put the bigger fan behind the heater and speed up the airflow through it? Now that's a whole lot more airflow. Brought it up to 11.42 amps, 11.43. Tiny bit of advantage. If I plug the fan also into here, that gives us 11.7. All right, we'll let it run. While the load test cooks, here's a closer look at those MOV specs. 
20D 201K is this one here on the chart, 130 volts AC or 170 volts DC continuous. Conduction of 1 milliamp begins between 185 and 225 volts. Capable of clamping 100 amps at 340 volts and withstanding a single event peak of 6500 amps. What catches my attention is the maximum value here of 95 joules. The surge protector specs claim 800 joules of protection. Three identical MOVs, somehow all working together perfectly, will handle 285 joules according to this datasheet. I'm finding mixed messages in the documentation on this in terms of surge protector design. Seems to me the 800 joule value is either overambitious or represents the kind of surge that will be stopped at the cost of the protector more or less exploding. I'm even more appreciative of those thermal fuses now. All right, we are approaching 45 minutes on the test. Ever so slightly warm, but nothing out of the ordinary for a device running at its rated load. Nothing at all there that I would find concerning. Finally, we have the overload test. Going to set this heater and this heater on their maximum and make sure that the overcurrent protection actually trips out in a reasonable amount of time. Let's go. Power's on. Max there. Max there. Max fan. And there it went. Protector circuit breaker is a little bit toasty. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It stopped the threat pretty quickly. Call that a pass. So what's the verdict? Build quality is good. MOVs have thermal protection. It handled load just fine. Overload protection works as intended, and I'm glad to see an overload indicator. I wish more power strips would do that. On the other hand, the protection working indicator is a glorified power on light, and comparing the MOV ratings to the unit ratings just raises more questions. Is this standard design practice? Guess we'll be tearing apart more surge protectors to find out. Do you design surge protectors? Have you had one blow up on you before? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, here's some options YouTube thinks you like. Thanks for watching.